All right, so yesterday I asked where everybody is from. Today I want to ask, how long have you been trading? Not successfully, not just when did you start? How many years ago did you start this trading thing? So most everybody here has been, been at this for some time. So now what I want to know from you guys, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about your trading up until today? Fives and fours, one, some sevens, sixes, threes, right about in the middle to lower middle on average, I would guess. Zero. <laughs> Tyson just dragged the the curve way down. <laughs> well, I hope we can help you with, with that. Um, I hope that something we have to say might stimulate that and maybe get you, if you're a three, make you a four or five. And if you're a five, maybe get you up to a six or seven, I hope. Um, we really want you to learn and, and know more about what we do and understand what it is that you're trying to do maybe a little bit better. And that is one of the problems that I had as a trader. I was struggling for a long time. I struggled for seven years and I couldn't get any traction. Um, and and I, I realized at one point towards the end of my seventh year that I was really no better that day than I was the very first day. And and that that was a kind of a a realization that bummed me out. But it was kind of the beginning of the new era for me. Uh, it was kind of the, the thing or one of the things that turned or began to turn things around for me was that realization that I had spent seven years collecting information and getting nowhere um, because I, I had a lot of things that I knew, but none of them were used as knowledge to help me get better at trading and I would also say that after seven years I would say my success rate uh, or how I felt about my trading was about like you guys some days I would feel like a seven most days I would feel like a three or four and and after seven years you think that you'd be a little further along than that and I know many of you have been at it for much longer than that but I managed to work my way through some of this stuff, and I decided that since I was uh, not really any better, that I needed to really rethink if I was either going to quit or was I going to try a completely different approach to this trading thing. So what I decided to do, I'm a contractor by trade. That's what I did for 20 years. I was a contractor, and my job as a contractor, remodeling and room additions and porches and sunrooms and decks and fences and that kind of stuff. So what I did was solve problems. I would go out on a, on a and do an estimate for somebody, and they'd say, we have a problem, and here's our problem, and here's what we think we want. I would tell them, okay, well, what you think you want may not really be what you want because of this and this and this. And they go, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I didn't even think of that. Okay, so that was my job as a contractor, was to help people solve problems and maybe even solve problems that they didn't even know they had. So I was very good at thinking through the whole process uh, and then coming up with ideas. But with trading, that didn't ever seem to be the, the way things went. You know, I just kept butting my head against the wall because I kept trying to learn what other people were telling me to do. I kept trying to learn different trading systems or, or, or find indicators or um, watch videos or attend webinars or whatever. I just kept trying to gather more and more and more information thinking someday that was going to turn into the perfect mix and that was going to cause me to suddenly become very successful at trading. Now, when I got to where I was like a seven, I might have thought, hey, I'm, I'm getting a handle on this. But within a very short period of time, I'm, I'm, I'm suddenly feeling like a three. And so what I decided to do was 
basically give up on trading. But just before I did that, I thought, you know what? Let me try this one thing. I'm not necessarily all that good at the thinky things, except as it relates to solving problems in my business. So what if I take that skill that I have? Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Let's give it a try. And let's take that skill and apply it to trading and see if I can get any more traction. So one of the things I started thinking about was that what was it that I was trying to accomplish as a trader? What did I need to be a trader? Well, being a winner, right? And, and so all you wanted to do is win trades. That's as far as I ever thought about what it was that I was trying to accomplish as a trader. It was a very broad definition when I was trying to learn how to trade. I was constantly trying to jump to and perform at a level of trading that would allow me to make a living at trading, even though I didn't really have any plan or skills or special abilities. I just knew I wanted to be a trader, and I had to make a lot of money because I, had, I was making good money at the, the contracting business, but I didn't want to do it anymore. And so I wanted to make a lot of money, and I needed to do it really quick because I was sick of either that business, okay? And maybe you're sick of your job or the commute or your boss or your coworkers or whatever, whatever it is that makes you want to be a trader. You don't want to uh, think about that. You want to start learning something now so that five years from now, maybe you can quit. You want to do it right now. So my mission... And trading was always about being a winner to make a lot of money, and that's all. That's as far as I got. Okay, now I just need to learn how to do it and make a lot of money. So here's my experience as it's summed up on a trading chart with my first seven years of trading. Now, instead of money, I am using emotion to measure how it is I felt about my trading at any given time. So I started out being pretty happy, having a good time, and then I started putting a little pressure on, hey, I think I want to make this my living. I'm going to work hard at it. I'm going to try this and this and this, and I'm going to start adding more contracts because I need to make more money because I lost a whole bunch of money, and now I need to make that money back, so I'm going to start trading more money, and I'm going to keep you know, doing more and more and more things and I keep hearing that I've got to be trading lots of contracts and I've got to be doing this and that and all these other things that I learned. And as you can see, my trading just started getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And the emotional impact it was having on me was causing it to get even worse. And then at some point, maybe it kind of started to level off, but never gained any traction. I was, I was generally very unhappy with my trading to that point. So you might say it's about at a range of a three or four or five, like what maybe you guys are saying. So maybe you guys can relate to to this. Maybe this 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 whole chart might look familiar to you as it relates to your your path in trading and how you've been going about doing your trading. So I started thinking about this. This is all part of the the thinking process that I went through. The, the race everything and start over process. And I started thinking, you know, what if I redefined for myself what winner means? What if I really think about this? Instead of trying to win a bunch of money every day, because that's how, you know, I, I, we all come into trading saying, okay, in my current profession, I make an average of this many dollars per day. In trading, that's what I need to make. So I'm going to start there. I'm going to start trying to make, I don't know, let's just say $200 a day. And you continually say, well, I'm, lo I'm a loser because I'm not able to, to achieve that kind of goal. Not only that, but you notice you start going backwards and maybe you lost $200 that day. Now you feel like you have to make $400 the next day. And you lose that $200. Now you got to make $600 the next day. Okay. So you get into, we all have done it. We all do it. We get into this thing about 
trying to define ourselves as a winner as it relates to what we need out of trading. But I started thinking about, okay, well, let's redefine winner. A winner is somebody who ends the day having earned more than they started the day with. By definition, you had a winning day. You do not need to win a lot of trades. You can win by a little and still be a winner. Now, I had to ask myself, can I do that? Because I had no idea if I could be a winning trader. So I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to try to win a little bit. And then I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it every day or as many days in a row as I can. My goal is just win. How much? Doesn't matter. Makes no, no, no difference initially. My thought was let me get good at winning regularly. Start to identify myself as a winner. So the fact is if you, if you try to get a little bit each day, the fact is if you even ended the day $5 ahead of where you started today, you mark yourself down as a winner that day and you know what? You're doing better than most of the other traders out there. If you can end the day as a trader, okay? So this was a realization for me. This was something I said, hey, you know what? Let me teach myself how to be a winner and then let me go from there. Let me, let me, let me try to create this foundation of learning that I can be a winning trader. Now, if you've been looking at charts very long, you've probably gotten pretty good at knowing when price is likely to move up or down by a tick or two. A lot of it is, is even subconscious. You know, you've been watching charts for a long time. You can probably 80% of the time say, yes, I can see that price is going to do something at least a little bit. Okay, I know that I could. So you've learned by watching trade room charts or, or charts that you could probably, I think most of us could probably say, I could, I could figure out where, if I watch the chart all day, I could figure out one place where I could know almost for sure that I could pick up a one or two tick winner, winning trade. But if you think about that, the first thing that pops into your head is, what good is one or two ticks? You know, you, we've all got this preconceived idea. But my thinking was, if I could just get two ticks today, and then I could do it again tomorrow, and then I could do it again the next day, well, I've proven something that I didn't know for seven years, and that is that I can be a consistent trader. And... If I can do that seven days in a row or 10 days in a row, I'm going to be a better trader than most traders out there with that kind of consistency. And that's something to build on. So instead of a, a, a curve like this, what if I shot for a curve like this simply by doing something very small, very simple, become the best in the world at it and grow it slowly over time. Okay, so that was my thinking. Well, funny thing is, that exact thing happened, but I did it in one year instead of seven. Because I was patient enough to understand that all I needed to do was to build a foundation to grow from. Okay, so yesterday we talked about the, uh, the indicators for order flow and understanding about order flow and, and why that happened. Now, today we're going to talk about knowing when price is exhausted and more important, why it gets exhausted. If you know why it gets exhausted, then you can anticipate the exhaustion. When exhaustion set ends, price is going to do something. 
almost every time. So if I can anticipate exhaustion before it happens, then I have an edge. So you look at this. You look at this. Is this is nothing? Oh no! <laughs> Sorry, John. So this is nothing, right? This is a just basic chart that you see all day long, every day. If you're trading, this is there's nothing in particular going on here that is immediately obvious. But I studied the charts and I started noticing something. This is me think, thinking on my own. This is me removing everything from the charts and then start to notice that I see something here where price is channeling. Price is not really doing much of anything. And then suddenly we get this breakout and this strong push of a few bars of straight up or straight down. Now, if you want to understand what's going on here, Go back to the video for yesterday. If you didn't get it, you'll get it in your email tonight. We also have a video on YouTube on applied volume spread analysis. You can watch that. That'll describe more about what's going on here. But I started noticing that we have this period of, of very quiet channeling where it's accumulation or distribution, which is what you'll learn in the other video. And then the sudden push up. So what's happening here during this sudden push up? Well, what's happening is that the, the sellers are up here at a certain level expecting and anticipating that the buyers are going to be starting to run out of gas. So what happens is, is at this point, you know, I, I hear a lot of people and it kind of, it kind of cracks me up that a lot of people think that there are uh, companies out there, big hedge funds that are stop hunters. That's how they make all their money is by running around, taking out all of our stops. I'm not saying that there's not companies that do that, but the big boys don't give a crap about our stops or trying to run our stops because they make all their money back here. This is just a manipulation to set them up to do it again. All right. So what we've done is we've reached an area where there's a lot of potential exhaustion and sellers are starting to get interested. So what happens when we have this sudden burst of energy here? It's generally unexpected. People get caught off guard. So those people have are two different people that are in trading, right? That are in this trade at this point in time or in the markets at this point in time. We have the sellers that are suddenly freaked out. They're like, oh no, price is going even further out of my control and further away from my target. I need to get out of this and save my butt. Or the other half of the people that are in the markets now are buyers and they're like ha ha I made a bunch of money I'm gonna cash out right here or at least scale out and take some profits so because of this big move this big move causes buyers and sellers to suddenly start exiting the market quickly so what happens when they start exiting all of them all at the same time that suddenly dumps a whole bunch of of um, liquidity on the markets, a whole bunch of contracts or assets or whatever it is. It dumps them on the market and then you know all about supply and demand, right? You can't be a trader without knowing about supply and demand. Suddenly supply overwhelms the demand for the product. And in all economies, including trading, that causes one thing to happen, it causes price to drop. So this is a, the result of a manipulation. So I wonder if I can anticipate this type of exhaustion before it happens. If I could, holy crap, what an edge, especially if I couple it with the stuff that I taught you about yesterday. 
So I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing a stinky thing that I'm not even sure I'm good at uh, as it relates to trading. I know I'm good at it as it relates to my construction business, but I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this thinky thing, and I'm going to look at this, and I go, is there any way I can anticipate that exhaustion before it happens? So I started thinking, you know, I need to, to just watch for these really strong pushes. Sometimes that momentum or this strong push may seem pretty obvious, but just by looking, you can't always tell. So I start looking at charts and I start thinking, if I could anticipate exhaustion and then couple it with the order flow stuff that I'm that I had already been studying, I may have a nice edge here. Okay, so you look at this chart. Where would you see the potential for exhaustion just by looking at the chart? Well, in some places, it may be relatively easy to see. And in other places, maybe not so much. We might need a little help. So what we're looking at here are two charts, one without our MoMeter indicator and one with our MoMeter indicator. The indicator helps us anticipate the potential for exhaustion by measuring the strength of the put of the push okay so it's likely it, it's important to know when a, a trend is likely to be becoming exhausted you know strong momentum doesn't always lead to exhaustion and a reversal but it does signal that something will most likely be changing soon and that the trend may consolidate or retrace i mean all trends do that right you look at any trend trends push and they push and push but never only in one direction, okay? So this momentum or this MoMeter indicator is letting you know or signaling when the magnitude of the price movement along with the direction is such that we can anticipate that the magnitude suggests that price is, is likely to be getting exhausted very soon. Now, in order for us to um, illustrate that to the trader, what we've done is we've, we've given you four different threshold levels inside the indicator so that you can just look at the bar and see how far into momentum we are and how likely we are to, become, uh, to price becoming exhausted. Okay, so we have the ability, these four different threshold levels. You have up threshold level and down threshold level. And you can color them any way that you want. This, this is our trade room setting. Okay, so this colors the, and, and tells us. So for us in the trade room, if it's black, we're just starting some momentum. It doesn't mean that it's strong momentum, but it's a momentum. And then it goes from black to gray to another color gray to another color gray, which is almost white, okay? So the lighter the color, this is how we do it in the trade room. You can certainly do it for up. You could do green for down. You could do different shades of red or whatever you want to do. But you can determine those levels and when they turn a certain color. And you can do that over here by setting threshold levels that work for you, okay? These are our trade room settings. But you could certainly set them for anything that you, for any any parameters that you want and make them um, more or less sensitive. Okay, so that's how our MoMeter indicator works. All right, so we're going to look at the next indicator and why it does what it does. So we've got this guy here that's motoring along, and he bought almost all of them, whatever those are, doesn't matter. But he bought all of the ones that existed, or almost all of the ones of those things, he bought all of them that existed. Very few of them exist now for other people to buy. So merchants now have a, have a problem, and they're going to try to go out and find more that they can sell, and those more are going to cost them more because they've become very rare. 
So we could say that that thing, those things that this guy bought, there's not much left for anybody to buy, right? Therefore, it's more valuable. You ever try to buy concert tickets after the concert sold out? What happens? Price goes up. All right, so we have an overbought condition. All right, so what about this guy? He's got too many, and nobody wants to buy them. So what's he going to do? Nobody's buying anymore, and, and more is becoming available all the time. Therefore, they're less valuable. Price is going to drop. It's oversold. All right, so that's overbought and oversold. In a nutshell, that might help you understand what's going on in the markets when you hear about price being overbought or oversold. The easiest way that we've historically been able to do this is by using an oscillator that will that will read typically momentum. That's a good way to, to determine if price has been overbought or oversold. You can use stochastics, you can use Keltner, you can use all kinds of different ways to determine if price has been overbought or oversold. But this is what we do in the trade room. We you, This is an RSI, Relative Strength Index Oscillator. It's a momentum oscillator. And what happens is, is when price gets to a certain point, of course, this is adjustable. You can adjust it any way you like, um, either more or less sensitive. And this one's uh, uh, fairly sensitive. And it's going to go to a point when price crosses an, uh, an extreme or a threshold that you set up inside this indicator, you're go you'll be able to say that price is overbought. Okay, so it has exceeded what is expected for price to be at this point in time. Now, the thing about having an oscillator like this on your screen is it takes up an awful lot of room to tell you most of the time that a condition does not exist. Well, you don't need to know it doesn't exist. You only need to know when it does exist. So we've removed that whole thing. Oh, before I say that, um, so all we want, what we're doing is we're painting the bars, the outside of the bars, with a color, user-definable color, that tells us right where our eyeballs are looking that price is overbought or oversold. So we no longer need the oscillator to tell us if it's overbought or oversold. We put it right on the bar, right where you, right where you're looking now. Inside this indicator, you have options. You don't have to paint the bars. If you don't like that, you can print an indicator on the bar. Okay, so right here, um, you can you can say in the display mode to paint the bar outlines or to print an object. You know, uh, one of the you know an arrow or a dot or whatever you want to do. You can do that here. You can change all the colors now. We use the RSI in the trade room, okay? Here's all the settings for the RSI. It, we also give you the ability to use um, a different oscillator. See right up here that we've selected RSI. But you can also use CCI. You can use the Williams R, Stochastics, uh, the Bollinger Bands, or Keltner Channel. You can use any of those that you feel is the better use of, of the, or the better oscillator or tool to use to determine if price is overbought or oversold and get those signals on your chart. So you don't have to do it the way we do it. This is just the way that it's done in the trade room. Okay. So now we've we found a couple of ways to read momentum and anticipate exhaustion. And and coupled with our pullback alert and our speed tick and the other stuff that we talked about yesterday, including our FT reset, our support and resistance lines, this you can see how this is starting to turn into something really powerful. So divergence for the for divergence, if if you don't know what divergence is, diverse divergence is is when price and something else start moving in different directions. Typically, that's going to be price and momentum. So when price and, and momentum are, are running, typically they're going to run together. Um, you know, when momentum is down, price is going to be down. When momentum is up, price is going to be up. But when they get out of sync, something happens. 
we have what's called divergence. And this is extremely powerful, probably, of all of the indicators we have. It's probably the closest one to a crystal ball that we have. Now, a lot of people don't use divergence because it's really hard to do with the naked eye. It's easy to screw up, and I'll show you that in, in a second. But divergence is essentially when price and momentum get out of sync with each other. Okay, so here we have a swing low or a lower low. Here we have a higher low. So we have a divergent condition here. So if you look quickly, and this is why it's so difficult, right? You got price on the top and then the momentum oscillator on the bottom, if you look carefully at this. And, and you have to do it quickly because you're trading, right? You don't have time to study. You've got to make a decision and go. So price is just kind of channeling here, and, and so is momentum. Nothing really going on. Price drops, momentum drops, comes up, comes up, uh, bounces around a little bit, drops, drops here, back up, over. Okay, so basically they're in perfect sync with each other, right? Setting a new lower low, both of them. Setting a new higher low, or lower high, for both of them. Oh, wait. Did you miss that? Price is setting a lower low. Momentum is setting a higher low. Well, look what happens to price. You know how often this happens? It's crazy how often this happens. One thing I want you to know is that when price and momentum get out of sync, price will almost always catch up with momentum. So if we're reading momentum and we're reading when these divergence areas are and when they occur, that gives us a huge advantage. All right, so here's a, a quick and easy way to understand this. So this is, a, this is an elementary little chart I put together just as an illustration. Yes, I know charts don't look like this, but it just makes it easier to understand. Okay, so we have the price dropping down and then going back up. We also have a momentum oscillator dropping down, going back up. Uh, the magnitude of change doesn't really change. At any point along these lines, they're going to be pretty much in agreement with each other. Now, let's look what happens when they get out of agreement. Let's look what happens when momentum starts turning before price. The magnitude of change is different, and you can see how easy it is for, uh, for to pick up where divergence is. And when that happens, price is usually lagging behind momentum and will try hard to catch up with momentum. It's crazy how it works. It's ridiculous how it works. Now, in order to read momentum as chance, and if you want to read lots of different momentums and lots of different divergences, you're going to need all this kind of stuff on your charts, which is really more and more and more stuff, making it harder and harder and harder to make a trade decision. This is the same chart showing the divergent signals from the RSI oscillator. Now, this is how we do it, okay? You'll notice that it just gives us a yes or no signal, and it gives that signal exactly where you're looking for it. This is our flash indicator. We've got another indicator called the um, McDiver that does the exact same thing using the same algorithm that... Um, but uh, instead uses the MACD momentum oscillator instead of the flash. So those two we traded for several years together, just like that. But, and those signals were awesome. And I kept getting asked if I could come up with something that did more and more and more oscillators. Well, we did. We came up with our Super D oscillator. Inside that oscillator, or inside, I'm sorry, inside that indicator, we have seven different oscillators to tell us when we have a divergent condition. Seven different oscillators using the same algorithm that we've been using for years, that's the best one I've found on the market for determining divergence. All right, so we've got those divergence indicators. And again, I'm, I'm hoping you notice that there are plenty of awards that we won that um, uh, last year or year before, um, they stopped doing them. That's why we uh, we don't have anything new to show. 
uh, they stopped doing those awards. Um, but we did win some trader awards from uh, the TraderPlanet.com, and uh, and that was voted on by the people at uh, uh, use the Trader Planet forum, I think. Now we come to the big boy. This is the one that has has dramatically improved a lot of our traders uh, trading. Funny thing is, is I resisted building this one for a long time because I honestly didn't think it was necessary. Because we already have, I've already shown you all of the tools to trade the rock star trade. But what I've done is I've combined them all to generate a signal. Okay. So we have all of those indicators that I've talked about yesterday and today on the left. And then on the right, we have the rock star. Now, I would never trade, personally, I would never trade the rock star without all those other indicators because those other indicators kind of give me a heads up that something is about to happen. And that's the whole point of all of this. But the rock star qualifies it for everybody without having to go, okay, this and this and this. Okay, go. The rock star has really has really changed a lot of people's trading. Now, this let's watch this. This is a video of the blank chart here. We have a chart here of our indicators and a chart here with just the rock star on it. So we'll let that play and let you watch how this works. Um, Ninja Trader, Armin. All right, so on the middle one, oh, sorry. I think I clicked away. The middle one, we have an oversold condition. Speed tick, talked about that yesterday. We have two different divergence signals. On this one, we have all of that, except it's all inside of this one indicator. I'm going to let this run just a little bit because we have several things um, for you to look at here. Let me see if I, I wonder if I can jump it ahead real quick. I want you to see this develop and how our indicators print. Look in the middle. Watch when our indicators print. They print on the current bar. There is no repainting. The indicators print in real time the instant a condition exists. We are not waiting for the close of a bar. We know, and that, that takes a lot of processing power to do that. We're reading every single tick as it comes in. So I know there's a, a theory out there that all indicators are lagging. By definition, they lag. That That is not our intention uh, here. We want the instant, the tick that comes in that tells us we have a condition, the instant it comes in, we print a signal. Now, I could show you this on static charts all day long. And if you go to other webinars, you probably watch guys do this and scroll around on static charts and tell you how great their stuff is on static charts. And then you actually watch it live and you go, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't, this doesn't work like I saw in the webinar. Because on static charts, it's easy to be compelling. It's easy to make things look a certain way. Because when you look at static charts and you look at a candlestick, you think you know and understand what it took to develop that candlestick. But the truth is, the only way that you know is by watching how the candlestick develops. Um, I have heard... Although I don't trade it, but I have heard people being successful at 15 minutes to an hour. I have no first-hand knowledge of that, Ken. See, my mission was to learn to be a successful trader and to be consistent. And I found it with this, so I stuck with this. We have a lot of people that buy our indicators off the website, just directly off the website and use them. They never tell us how they're using them. Armin, NinjaTrader is free. Uh, we don't have any plans to uh, develop for Sierra Charts. I used to use Sierra Charts many years ago, and I liked it. But you can use NinjaTrader for free. 
Does your program give us the name of the stock? Well, these are all futures, Charles, and I don't know what this particular instrument is, but in the trade room, we trade six different futures instruments. Armin, you do not need to buy a license to use NinjaTrader. It is absolutely free unless you want to place trades with it. The charting is free. These are minute charts, Dave. Uh, yeah, this is the CL. All right, so you can see easily enough how this Rockstar works, how our indicators work, how they work on a chart. I do not have the ES on this computer. Joseph, I uh, this is a work computer. This is not a trading computer. But if you have something specific that you'd like to see a certain day or whatever, send us an email and we'll send you some charts. Now, yeah, that's a, a good question, John. Yes, these are this is a purchase of a license. This is not a lease. So if you want to learn how to trade that Rockstar trade setup, here's a video on YouTube that you can uh, uh, go to, and it's a whole event that we did. I think it's like a two-hour video. We've got some special offers that we're doing this week. 